All right, Jim O'Neill also joining us now, Chair of Chatham House and ex-Treasury Minister and ex-Chair of GSAM. Jim, great to have you with us on a day like today. We are all trying to make sense of this sell-off. It's just melting and melting across the board. I remember last time we spoke, it was in the throes of, you know, all that was going on with regards to trade. But we've been hit uh, out of left center with, uh, with the coronavirus and now with the crude war. So first, let me just get your take. Are the markets screaming that a recession is around the corner? Um, yes, I would say the markets are saying that, sadly. Uh, doesn't, by the, uh, let me quickly add, it doesn't mean to say they're right. Uh, Samuelson's famous comment that uh, the markets have put, correctly predicted eight of the last two recessions. Um, you know, markets do do this sometimes, and it doesn't lead to the consequence that people fear. But uh, at the same time, uh, when we have recessions, markets normally do what they're doing now. So, uh, and obviously there is some justification for it. Just the sheer, the sheer uncertainty of it, the fact that a country or the richest part of Italy uh, is seeing such uh, worrying uh, loss of life and dramatic spread of the infection. And we, we're not sure, unlike in 08, what is the right monetary and fiscal policy response uh, to undertake. So, understandably, people are, are very worried. But uh, what will now happen will really depend on the quality and the effectiveness of the policy response around the world. We're all waiting for that, uh, Jim, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But coming to the coronavirus in particular, and, and it's an issue that, that really no one has any idea, you know, how severe, how much longer, what, you know, what kind of effect it's going to have on the globe. But is the selling at the moment overdone? Because, you know, we were speaking to another expert in the morning who said that, uh, you know, the number of deaths or the number of people infected are still, uh, you know, in, 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 the number is incredibly small compared to some of the other uh, issues plaguing the world. Well, that, that, that is obviously true. Um, and uh, in, this, in that same part of, uh, uh, of trying to look at it constructively, it is interesting to me that China seems to have halted the spread of infection and, and, and more encouragingly, perhaps, for the rest of us, uh, both um, South Korea and, and Japan, uh, that were countries that we were worried about a lot three weeks ago, are showing some tentative signs of slowing of infection and, and much smaller death rate than Italy. Um, so that's true. However, and what that comment doesn't acknowledge is the Chinese essentially shut down their entire economy for the month of February. If you look at the PMI indicators, both manufacturing and services, they were exceptionally weak. The services won fell in half. And what the markets are understandably worrying about uh, is if this is what Northern Italy has now decided to do over the weekend, which it has, uh, how many, A, how many other countries are going to do the same? And B, can, can countries that are democracies in such difficult circumstances be as rapidly successful as China in, in, in controlling this virus. And that's why the markets are, are doing what they're doing. Whether it's a panic or not, we will only, know, of course, know with hindsight. I, I suspect uh, six months from now, we will look back and think uh, we're grateful that it was only short-lived. But there are, there are a lot of unusual things and interlinkages to be worrying about here. Uh, you know, one point of view, Jim, given the kind of liquidity we've had sloshing about uh, globally in the system, uh, you know, does that imply that, it, you know, contrary to expectations that we're going to hit a recession, uh, you know, that there will actually be a recovery because it's got to have somewhere to go. So, I mean, do we view this as a crisis or do we view it as an interim, you know, correction, volatility, what have you? Well, I, 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 it's very complex. I try to break it down into three separate parts. First of all, in many ways, 2008 was like a severe demand shock. And that was a dramatic crisis, but uh, it resulted in the need for, and we got it, an enormous monetary and fiscal policy response. 
Secondly, this one uh, has an element of demand shock because we're deliberately closing uh, economies down and, and tourists can't go anywhere and concerts and sports events are gradually being cancelled everywhere, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also, and this is the second point, it's an enormous supply shock. Uh, people aren't being allowed to work normally. People aren't being allowed to move. Uh, and uh, we, we don't know yet until we really understand for more weeks about this infection, how permanent we will have to change aspects of how we all integrate with each other. Uh, hopefully, it will turn out to be a, a very temporary thing, a bit like SARS or, or even worse, death rate, death rate the, the so-called MERS, but we, we simply don't know. And what, what is uh, worrying people uh, over the weekend this morning, Italy has close to 5% of the people reported as being infected as sadly having lost their lives. And if you had that replicated all over the, uh, the rest of the world, that obviously would be a colossal uh, loss of life and very problematical for, for modern life as we know it. Which comes to the third issue is it's not as though policymakers know exactly how to respond to something like this. What, what does it mean uh, for how we all behave in big urban environments where we're just so used to being in such uh, tight communication all day long? Uh, and it's very hard to know, and people panic. Uh, this is not just financial markets panicking. I don't know what it's like... Uh, in Mumbai or Delhi, but in supermarkets in the UK over the weekend, there are, there's widespread evidence of people hoarding basic uh, items for normal life, which probably is also excessive, but it's understandable by pe why people are. The issue, Jim, obviously is crude. Let's talk about that for a moment. You know, it's, it's traditionally an indicator, of course, of global growth and talking, taking from what you just said on demand, supply and, and, and that entire dynamic. Do you also see, though, crude dislocating uh, some of the other assets now going forward? I, I think, I think in what's happened over, over, overnight in crude is a, is a fresh, separate shock to the system. Uh, because of the size of the move down and... and of course, it appears to be because of the breakdown in uh, any uh, consensus between Russia and Saudi Arabia in particular. The markets are now worried about many, many forms of leverage uh, in the energy supply provision, particularly uh, in oil and especially as it relates to shale gas, where there's been a lot of pe uh, companies that have borrowed a lot of money. So it, we're now, we've now got... A, uh, an additional aspect that was uh, directly reminiscent of 08 in that the markets are worrying about some vicious circle developing between uh, uh, default risk and credit. And uh, that does require central banks and, and fiscal policymakers to make it clear that they're going to be there to keep the system flowing. Uh, <clears throat> Jim, uh, really closing comments. You know, with each... Uh shake out, there's always an opportunity. And it is often yeah. said that you should never waste a crisis. This indeed is a crisis. Yeah. But for somebody who's yeah. saying, look, I'm an investor, I am very sympathetic to what is happening to SARS, uh, what is happening because of coronavirus, but I want to use this crisis as an opportunity to invest or create wealth. What would you advise? So, uh, you know, I often, I often say that the two things you've just said uh, were big some of the very few things I learned in my career. Never let a crisis go to waste. Uh, and the best investment opportunities actually do come out of crises. So uh, however complex this crisis is, uh, and because policymakers have to do the best they can do to try and keep our lives uh, sustained in a, in a healthy and satisfactory way, we are going to get a policy response. So I think for individual or institutional investors that are not constrained by so-called mark-to-market risk, almost definitely, as we're speaking, this is a good opportunity to buy some quality uh, equity-related investments, so long as you don't have to look at their price tomorrow or the day after. But I suspect uh, the kind of scale of sell-off we've now seen 
uh, as of this morning means that there are opportunities that people that have the luxury of being able to not mark to market their exposure will, will in, in the future, be pleased they've done. You know, you've touched upon central bank action a couple of times. I must ask, given that we're entering a zero or negative rate scenario, uh, how much ammunition do we have left and what would you like to see? The G7 meet didn't come up with anything. Uh, here in India, we haven't heard anything from the central bank following the Fed's move. Uh, we've got um, Europe down so heavily today. Uh, are you expecting to hear any time in the next 24 hours? Uh, what can we anticipate? Um, well, first of all, I'm in the camp that, does, that believes uh, monetary policy is not the right thing uh, to respond with here. I mean, we are deliberately stopping people from doing their normal uh, activities. So cutting interest rates is of, uh, of no direct benefit. In fact, as we saw when the Fed cut rates uh, uh, last, well, the week before last or last week, I forget, um, if anything, it added to the sense of panic. Uh, and, and it, you know, you can't, obviously, it's a unique circumstances, but you can't ignore the environment. And linked to uh, actual and perceptions of inequality, I think the whole role of QE has long since passed its usefulness. And so uh, I'm saying that, and I do think, however, central banks probably will still cut interest rates, but I don't expect that that will do any good. What we need is uh, more thoughtful, immediate measures, or let's call it more of a, uh, of a structural, sorry, of a fiscal nature, including for the financial system, where, where our governments essentially uh, delay uh, company tax payments, particularly for small business. Because if we're going to close people down from functioning, we're obviously deliberately stopping companies getting their normal revenue. And so we need to make it as easy as possible for them to survive whilst we're asking people to be responsible and do extraordinary things. Uh, and so that related to some forms of fiscal expenditure, particularly money to improve the quality of health systems, is much more the sort of thing I would guess that, that should happen now as opposed to conventional monetary policy. Yeah. I, I cannot see why uh, the Fed cutting interest rates again at its FOMC meeting is going to be of any relevance in terms of helping this. All right, Jim, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, as always, for taking the time. And it was great speaking with you today in light of everything that is taking place, uh, you know, with regards to markets around the world.